Hi guys, Professor Paul here with an After Effects tutorial on chroma keying. Now there's a lot to chroma keying and it, it, it seems really simple at first. Um, you know, you bring in something that was shot on a green screen and you sample the green and it goes away. But there's actually a lot more to it. Uh, so we're going to actually break this up into a, a couple of different tutorials to kind of figure out how to get the most out of uh, your keys and, and the best results with your keys in After Effects. Uh, if you've been following my Nuke tutorials at all, this is really similar to the approach I take when keying in Nuke. And so I'm actually adapting the, um, the techniques that we use in Nuke into the After Effects environment. But before we, we can really dig deep into uh, keying, we need to do the basics. So first things first, go to the description of this video and you'll find a couple of Dropbox links. I've got a, a, uh, a JPEG that we'll use as our background and then we've got a, uh, a plate.mov that we will use as our uh, foreground. And once those are in your After Effects, go ahead and drag the, uh, the plate to the new composition. And we can kind of scrub through this and you'll see it's uh, an old student of mine, Brandon, walking on the green screen, and uh, and he's doing sort of his uh, his spooky haunted house walk. Um, we're really going to mostly deal with the last frame of this, so you can just go ahead and and skip to the last frame. And this is, in general, what I'll do is I'll find a spot where the subject is as far into frame as they're ever going to get. Um, so in a shot like this, you know, it doesn't pay to, to do any of your keying work on this first frame because you don't have your subject. And earlier on, we maybe aren't seeing his entire, um, his entire body or, you know, the, the extent of his body that's going to end up on frame. So I want, really want to go to the, the spot where, you know, he's fully in. And if he were walking out of this frame, then obviously I'd start at the beginning. So in this case, because he's walking in, we're going to start at the end. Uh, so what we're going to do is look at the, the keying category in our effects and presets palette. So go ahead and click on your effects and presets palette. And in the, the little search box, just start typing key. And you're going to see there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that come up. Uh, we're going to ignore the thing called smoky. Smoky. We're going to get rid of that. We're going to ignore these image utilities. We'll hide that. Anything that's obsolete, we'll hide because we're not going to deal with those. Uh, and then you've, that really just leaves us with these five items, the color difference key, the inner outer key, the key cleaner, key light, and the linear color key. Now, when you're really working in, in visual effects, you never want to be working in, in uh, the lower quality modes in After Effects. And this is a good time to really point this out. If you haven't uh, messed with your bits per channel in your After Effects setup, now's the time to do it. So you, you actually see here at the bottom of my project window, uh, next to my little three buttons, you see mine says 32 bits per channel, 32 BPC. If you click that, yours, yours may say eight bits per channel if you're just, uh, just starting out in After Effects. And that's usually the default. Eight bits per channel, there's 16 bits per channel, there's 32 bits per channel, uh, which is also known as floating point. Um, I'm not, there's really not time in this tutorial to get into what floating point is, but suffice to say that you, uh, you want to be in 32 bits per channel. It's gonna be the highest color depth, and particularly when dealing with chroma keying, where, where so much is dependent on accurate reads of color, you're gonna wanna be in this 32 bits per channel because it just gives you a lot more uh, gradations between black and white in every one of your uh, R, G, B, and alpha channels. So you're going you're gonna to want to stick with that. So switch to 32 bits per channel, hit OK, and then that pretty much eliminates these two 16-bit only, these first two color difference key and inner outer key. Um, key cleaner is something that you would apply after you've done a, a, a key, and really that just leaves us with key light 1.2, which is built into After Effects. Now there are other keying plugins out there. There's other other matting plugins that you can buy, um, but for my money, Keylight is just a good, solid, reliable, basic here. So let's go ahead and put Keylight on Brandon here, and I'm not even going to worry about the background yet. 
for right now, I just want to deal with him. So the it's pretty obvious. The right off the bat, you've got your uh, key light banner. You've got the view says final result, uh, un pre multiply result. We'll just always leave that checked for now. Uh, then screen color, screen gain, screen balance, some d spill and alpha biases, and then a whole bunch of settings that can get twirled down. Right now, let's just stick with screen color. So go ahead and grab your eyedropper and pick a spot. I like to pick a spot, you know, relatively near the subject, right? Because the green could be a lot brighter out here. It could be a lot darker, you know, down here. It's going to give me unreliable results. What I really want, what I'm most concerned with is the, the shade of green that is immediately near the actor. Everything else I can get rid of with garbage mats, you know, with some masking and stuff like that. Um, but I'm actually going to try and avoid that if I can on this one. So you can see when I when I click that screen color, uh, it immediately starts to remove the green, and it's not doing a terrible job. It's 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 okay. It's doing a pretty decent job. We can zoom in and kind of see what is happening with his hair. There's some kind of funky discoloration in his hair. The tracking dots on the green screen are having a little bit of a hard time, and there's actually a whole bunch of noise here. You can see a lot of the the grain pattern of the original footage. So we're gonna have to deal with that. Um, we also, you know, might have some areas like where his beard is and uh, and kind of back here on, on the back of his head where the hair detail is just kind of wrecked. So we're gonna have to deal with that. So we almost don't even wanna look at the RGB values yet. We really wanna just be dealing with alpha. So what we need to do is we need to look at the mat that's being generated by our keyer. So where it says underneath key light, where it says view final result, go ahead and choose uh, combined mat. So that's going to be the final result of any uh, adjustments that we make in this panel. This is going to be the result of it. So you can see right, right now it's giving me a pretty decent result where the screen has gone black. And remember, in a matte or an alpha channel, black is transparent. And it's giving me a pretty solid white figure. And remember, white is opaque. We, this is what we want. We want Brandon to be opaque and his green background to go transparent. You can see it's not perfect, though. We've got a lot of uh, sort of banding up here in this upper left corner where, it, where the screen is a little brighter. We've got some haze in the upper right corner, so some banding in the upper left, some haze in the upper right. Uh, we've got tracking markers all over the place, and then we've got some spots on Brandon himself that aren't white. They're going sort of gray, and you can kind of see that uh, this is going to be a problem. We're going to have some issues here where it's going to be he's going to be partially see-through. And to show you that, let's go ahead and go back to our final result, and let's bring our background in. So go back to your project window. And grab your background and drop that in and it's gonna kind of be hard to see but if I were to move the background around there it is you can kind of see it moving right here there's a it may and it may be hard to see in this uh, in the the encoded tutorial but basically if you move it around you're gonna kind of see the the texture of that background moving through his shirt. Uh, and I think it's probably gonna be even more noticeable in his face, although maybe not. But at any rate, we have to deal with those holes. So for right now, let's just go ahead and hide that, uh, that background and let's get back into key light. So I have to deal with those holes and I have to clean up all this, this stuff out here. So let's go back to our combined matte view in key light. And let's just start messing with screen gain. So screen gain, if you turn that up, it's basically just kind of mopping up all that extra stuff. It's, it's, it's essentially adjusting how bright the remainder of the screen is. That's kind of the easiest way to look at it. <clears throat> screen balance, let me go ahead and set my screen gain back to 100. Screen balance is essentially a, a contrast slider, so you can see it's kind of shifting the white and black points together, right? So it's adjusting both Brandon and the screen. I almost never 
mess with that. I almost always leave it at the midpoint uh, because it generally gets be better results. So I'm just going to turn this up a little bit, okay? Probably not too much because one of the issues, like I said, is going to be what is it doing to Brandon's hair, right? We really need to look at, let's look at the source. See how Brandon's got all this sort of, you know, wispy stuff going on? If I look at my combined mat, you can see it's all gone when I when I really start cranking that screen gain up. So I, I don't really want to mess with that too much. Um, I'm trying to do as little damage to his hair and do as little damage to his edges as possible. And screen gain can tend to be uh, a fairly crude tool that, uh, that can really mess up what you're doing. So we have to look at some other options. And we're not going to get into these despill biases uh, just yet. Um, so we'll kind of skip over those. But if you look at screen pre-blur, pre-blur, yeah, screen pre-blur, pre that is a mouthful. But if I mess with that, and it, it can really um, tend to kind of finesse out a lot of details, again, this is not something I really mess with at all. because. I'm trying to retain as much of the original detail in the plate as possible. So I'm going to leave that alone. Where I do most of my work is in screen matte. And what I'm going to try and do is use screen matte to uh, begin clipping values. <clears throat> and this is really, really similar to, um, really similar to if I put, let's say if I put a levels effect on. I want to use levels to just kind of show you what these uh, clip white and clip black do before we really get into them. So if I put levels on here, you can see the histogram of what the keyer is outputting. And, and I, I can see, you know, there's sort of all this messiness in here, right? This is the screen, and then this is all the noise. And then this is Brandon, and this is all the noise in him. So really what I want to do is I want to clip the blacks and clip the whites to get my best result, okay? That's exactly what we're going to do over in key light, okay? Rather than doing it this way, I want to do it in key light, all right? So I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to go back to key light, and I'm just going to start clipping the blacks. Now again, I can clip all the blacks away, but you can see I've done a lot, a lot of violence to uh, Brandon's hair. We've just done so much damage to it and it's gonna be really hard to get that back. So I'd rather not clip the blacks that much. I'd rather just clip the black just enough to make the area around him start to look better. And I'm gonna really finesse this. I'm gonna hold down my command key or control if you're on a PC. Hold down my command key and I'm going to drag by very very small increments. I'm trying to make those tracking dots immediately around Brandon disappear, okay? Again, I'm gonna put it back to zero. I just want to clean up this haze around him. And really, if I end up having to go too far, I might take those tracking dots out another way. But this is what I'm most concerned about. I'm, I'm most concerned with having this stuff right here around Brandon being completely black. So let's go to our info and let's hover in here, and you can see in the info tab, you can see the RGB values, right? Again, we're we're dealing with RGB values. These are gonna going to become alpha values when we switch this back to our final result view. But because we're looking at the mat and it's outputting the mat to RGB, we're looking at the RGB values. Okay, so don't don't pay attention to the A value. Pay attention to RGB. I want RGB to be zero. Where the screen is transparent, it needs to be zero. Okay. Same up here, I want it to be zero. Same here, uh, you can see I've actually got a little bit of, of gray value still. I'm seeing a 0 .0298. That's not bad, but if I just uh, nudge my clip black up just a skosh more, I should be able to knock that down. I'm trying to get that to zero. doesn't have to be perfect, 
Yeah, that's good, okay? Just 10%. I had to go to 40 or so to get rid of all of this stuff. We don't want to do that. All right, next thing I need to do is deal with these gray spots on Brandon. And again, if I hover in here, you can see I'm seeing 0 0.95, 0 0.94, something like that. So that tells me if I take my clip white down to in the neighborhood of about 94, I should start seeing those holes fill in. Another way to do this is actually to take your viewport gamma and turn it up and down and you can start to see like if you've left anything behind. So if I crank it all the way up you can see I still have a little bit of non-black pixels in here. So let's just turn that up just a smidge more. Okay, so that's feeling pretty good. I still have an issue right here so we need to take that down some more. I'm just hovering my cursor in here. Now edge pixels can go gray. I'm okay with edge pixels going gray. I don't want to make them all super solid. Right, hair in particular is very, not transparent, but translucent, right? I could make all this go away. I could crank this all the way down and really, you know, chunk his hair up. And that's gonna look just awful right it's he's gonna have this weird outline his hair is gonna lose any sort of see-throughness to it um, it's just it's just bad right what I want to do is I want to stay you know as I want to do as little clipping as possible so I can keep those grays so when I actually look at my final result his hair is gonna be nice and soft now sorry that I went to intermediate result I want to go to final result Right, so now I can see a little bit of softness. So when I turn the background back on, I should be seeing, you know, a little bit of his hair with the background behind it. Okay, so that's what I'm after. I'm looking for doing as little damage as possible. Now, obviously, I've still left behind a whole bunch of tracking dots and haze on the screen. So this is where some masking comes in. And again, this is gonna be a garbage mat. This is not going to be roto, okay? This is just a garbage mat. So what I wanna do with this is just grab my pen tool and I want to, I want to uh, go full screen and just do, just a really simple loose mask. And that will get rid of the vast majority of this stuff. I still have these little guys in here, um, which I could either pull this mask in tight or I could do separate little masks. This is entirely your choice. But the important bit here now is we have to keyframe this mask to follow him. So I'm just going to hit M on, twice on my keyboard and activate keyframing for the mask path. And then <clears throat> I'm going to just scrub backwards. And adjust this and the reason why I make this this mask as loose as possible is I don't want to have to keyframe every frame I want to keyframe like every 10 frames if I can get away with it right something like this something like this Towards the entrance here, I just need to keyframe a few more, a little bit more frequently than every 10 frames because I'm not sure when he exits. But if I were to play this, it should be pretty good. Obviously, I've got these little tracking dots that pop in and out. Some individual masks can be done for those to, uh, to clean those up. So I might just kind of zoom in here maybe actually again start from the back from the end crank up my viewport gamma a little bit and then with my masking tool just do a couple of masks and set these guys to subtract 
Obviously, if you set them to subtract, you can't see what you're doing if you have to keyframe them. So it's probably a good idea to leave them as none for a bit. Do your keyframing, and then once you've got them all done, subtract them, right? So for now, I'm just going to leave those two. You can feel free to uh, go in and keyframe those additional ones. Let's go ahead and reset our viewport gamma, and let's hide our mask outlines. And then let's go ahead and turn on our background again so we can see sort of what's going on and how well he fits into this background. It's pretty good. Obviously, the moonlight is motivating this highlight on his face. But in general, the contrast is very different and the, uh, the color tone is very different. Um, we could, if we wanted to, start messing with our... Uh, our color here, it's changing you know, our despill balance and, uh, bias and things like that. But to me, I, I almost want to leave the, the result of key light as neutral as possible and then do my additional color correction. Um, you can see there's a foreground color correction tab in here and I'm, I don't really use this. I'd much rather use tools that are uh, standalone tools that like, like curves and levels, things I'm used to that I use in other places. Um, and it's strictly an efficiency thing. I, 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 when I look at a layer, I want to just immediately see the curves, see the levels or whatever I'm doing and not have to go dig into a, another, uh, effect to find whatever color effect I'm making, especially if I were to come back to a comp, you know, six months or a year later, I would probably forget that I even touched this, these tabs in here and I would be kind of going crazy trying to figure out where the color correction was happening. But if I saw curves and levels on there, I would immediately know what I had done. Um, another thing I wanted to show is there's something called D-spot white and D-spot black. We didn't really get into that. But with those, we might be able to actually remove these tracking spots. As the name implies, it allows you to remove spots and the the names are oddly inconsistent uh let's go back to combined matt you would think d spot black would be to remove spots in the black but you'd be wrong you actually are looking at d spot white in other words trying to remove white spots so this would be another and possibly more efficient way to remove those tracking dots uh, that are left behind however you can see what it's doing to brandon's hair and that's because this is a, effectively a, a blur of sorts. And you can see it's just really wrecking his hair. So that's why I generally don't do that. Now, D-Spot Black might be useful if you just had some little specks in here. But again, the more you crank that up, the more it's going to affect everything. So I really usually don't mess with that on very very rare occasions will I will I uh, get in there and and actually you know do some despotting but if there's hair involved it's pretty much it's not gonna happen you're you're, you're gonna have to do um, your masking in order to get rid of those little those little defects in the screen it just is what it is uh, and it doesn't matter how good you are at shooting green screen or blue screen uh, you are always going to have to deal with little defects in the screen. It just, it's, it's just the nature of the beast. Even when I was in Hollywood and working on network TV shows that were shot by incredible professional directors of photography, the blue screens and green screens were still pretty often just trash, and we had to, we spent a lot of time cleaning them up. It's, it's just the nature of, of that particular technique, dealing with green screen, blue screen. All right, so let's go back to our final result. Let's turn our background back on and then go to our effects and presets and let's just grow, go ahead and throw curves on there. Uh, and one thing I wanna do is I really wanna look at, let's look at where, kind of where the black points are. So if you look at, and maybe actually levels would be a better way to do this, but let's try it with curves first. So he's wearing a black shirt and there's this black in the background. You can see the two blacks really, really don't match. So this is a, this would be a good way to kind of get 
get these guys kind of lined up. So what I want to do is I really want to look at, um, let's look at the red channel first. And you can see there's a lot more red in Brandon's shirt than there is in the background. So let's go ahead to the red curve. And we're going to take a lot of red out. And you can see I'm dialing Brandon's shirt closer to that background color. Uh, let's go to green. Again, there's a lot more green in Brandon's shirt than there is in the background. So we'll go ahead and grab the green. Drag that down. And then let's go to the blue channel. And there's a bit a bit more blue in there. All right, let's see what we got now. Hey, that's starting to feel pretty good. His black point is starting to feel pretty good, pretty close, okay? Now what we need to do is look at midtones. And again, we're going to look at something that's sort of a midtone gray. Kind of his his shirt here or the lit area of his shirt is kind of a mid-tone gray. So I'm going to do the same process again and I'm going to compare probably to this right here. All right. So we'll go to the red channel. And again, still a lot more red in there. Right? This is a lot brighter than that. So let's go to our red channel. I'm just take some uh, some mid-tone out. Try and get that closer, right? That's a red of about 0.32. Still could come down some more. All right, and let's look at our green. Same thing, go to our green channel. It's 0 0.37, 0 0.54, so we gotta bring this down quite a bit. And obviously, because it's a very blue tone in that background, we're going to end up taking a lot more, quite a bit more red out than than the other channels. All right, let's look at our blue. Okay, that's not bad. 0 0.41, 0 0.49. So we just need to take a little bit of blue out. And again, I'm just referencing these numbers up here in the upper right corner. That probably feels pretty good. Let's look at the RGB. Hey, all right. Uh, I've kind of wrecked his skin tone a little bit, so I probably need to just put some red, maybe take a little bit more red out of the, the high end. All right, take some out there. Maybe take some green out. And this one I'm just eyeballing. All right, leave some blue. That's starting to feel pretty good. That's a pretty rudimentary color match. Um, <clears throat> but it actually, to me, feels a little easier than trying to just eyeball it. Like you're, you're looking at the Luma values in the red, green, and blue and comparing those, and it's a little easier than comparing uh, you know, the color values. It's just easier for the human eye to see um, luminance differences than color differences. So his skin just looks a little, I don't know, sallow. Um, I might want to just mess with this a little bit. And again, maybe go to the blue, take some of that, take some of that high end out. And it's counterintuitive because taking some of that high end out is actually making this curve between these two points go up, right? You can see when I go up with it, that curve goes down and it introduces a lot of yellow to his skin. Now another thing I could do is probably throw a little desat on him. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to uh, hue and saturation. He was a bit more saturated than the original plate or than the uh, background plate. And uh, let's make sure we put it above curves, and just we can just knock our saturation down just a skosh, right? Just to make it feel a little more night esque. All right, so that's kind of the basics of. Uh, color keying and a little bit of uh, of color matching for uh, for your composites in uh, in After Effects. We're gonna get into 
much more involved uh, keying coming up because we really have to deal with this hair. I am not happy with this hair at all. I mean, it's decent, but I think we could get more, more detail out of it, more softness out of it. The other issue I have is he's got kind of got this little bit of a, of a razor edge on him that we need to deal with. You can see a little bit of uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, pre-malt error, if you will, where the black kind of gets punched up a little bit right on that, right on that edge, and then it's got this white edge to it. Um, that's these things are one of the pitfalls of kind of dealing with RGB and alpha in the same composite. In future installments, I, I'm going to really look at how we can separate RGB and alpha into uh, separate uh, pre comps and then combine them in your final comp and have a lot more control over uh, over everything, over you know all the little fine details and uh, and really make your your chroma keys look amazing. So. I uh, hope you enjoyed this, and uh, I will see you next time. Thanks.